In Deuteronomy, God promises to raise up a prophet like Moses who speaks for God. In Psalm 111, God shows the people the power of God's works. For the church, these are ways of pointing to the unique authority people sensed in Jesus' actions and words. We encounter that authority in God's word around which we gather, the word that prevails over any lesser spirit that would claim power over us, freeing us to follow Jesus. Good morning and welcome to worship on Sunday, January 31st, 2021. I can't believe it's already the end of January, but here we are. So I have a few uh, prayer list additions to make this week um, prior to beginning the service. Uh, first of all, last week we added Lois, a sister of Laura Whaley, to the list who is um, recovering from COVID-19. Um, this week we need to add Laura's other sister, Ruth, to the list who had an emergency appendectomy this week. So please keep Laura and James and Laura's sisters and their families in your prayers this week. Um, also, please add to your prayers Keith Holy, 
um, who is um, beginning uh, treatment for his prostate cancer. And um, if you would keep me in your prayers, if you have a few extras left over, uh, I am recovering from a positive COVID-19 test, so uh, I'm doing well. Everything is going away, and I expect to be back to normal next week. So um, if you would keep those people in your prayers this week, we would appreciate it. Um, also, make sure that you're reading the weekly email blast that we send out. All of the rest of the announcements that we need to make are in that, so I'm not going to reiterate those. Um, have a great week. Um, enjoy the service, and we hope to be able to see you sometime soon. I know I keep saying that, but sometime it's going to happen. Have a good day. Good morning and welcome to worship. We begin our service today with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, as you once brought freedom and wholeness to a man possessed by an unclean spirit, so you continue to bring freedom and wholeness to your people in these days. Bless us with knowledge of your word that we may follow in your ways to all the green pastures to which you will lead us. In Jesus' name.
The first reading is from the 18th chapter of Deuteronomy. Moses said, The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from among your own people. You shall heed such a prophet. This is what you requested of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, If I hear the voice of the Lord my God any more, or even again see this great fire, I will die. Then the Lord replied to me, They are right in what they have said. I will raise up for them a prophet like you from among their own people. I will put my words in the mouth of the prophet, who shall speak to them everything that I command. Anyone who does not heed the words that the prophet shall speak in my name, I myself will hold accountable. But any prophet who speaks in the name of other gods, or who presumes to speak in my name a word that I have not commanded the prophet to speak, that prophet shall die. The word of the Lord. Today's psalm is Psalm 111. Hallelujah! I will give thanks to the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright in the congregation. Great are your works, O Lord, pondered by all who delight in them. Majesty and splendor mark your deeds, and your righteousness endures forever. You cause your wonders to be remembered. You are gracious and full of compassion. You give food to those who fear you, remembering forever your covenant. You have shown your people the power of your works in giving them the lands of the nations. The works of your hands are faithfulness and justice. All of your precepts are sure. They stand fast forever and ever because they are done in truth and equity. You sent redemption to your people and commanded your covenant forever. Holy and awesome is your name. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. All who practice this have a good understanding. God's praise endures forever. Today's second reading is from the 8th chapter of 1 Corinthians. Now concerning food sacrificed to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. Knowledge puffs up, but love builds up. Anyone who claims to know something does not yet have the necessary knowledge, but anyone who loves God is known by him. Hence, as to the eating of food offered to idols, we know that no idol in the world really exists, and that there is no God but one. Indeed, even though there may be so-called gods in heaven or on earth, 
as in fact there are many gods and many lords. Yet for us there is one God, the Father, from whom all things and for whom we exist, and one Lord, Jesus Christ, through whom are all things and through whom we exist. It is not everyone, however, who has this knowledge. Since some have become so accustomed to idols until now, they still think of the food they eat as food offered to an idol, and their conscience, being weak, is defiled. Food will not bring us close to God. We are no worse off if we do not eat, but no better off if we do. But take care that this liberty of yours does not somehow become a stumbling block to the weak. For if others see you, who possess knowledge, eating in the temple of an idol, might they not, since their conscience is weak, be encouraged to point of eating food sacrificed to idols? So by your knowledge, those weak believers for whom Christ died are destroyed. But when you thus sin against members of your family and wound their conscience when it's weak, you sin against Christ. Therefore, if food is a cause of their falling, I will never eat meat so that I may not cause one of them to fall. The word of the Lord. Today's gospel is from the first chapter of Mark. Jesus and his disciples went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, he entered the synagogue and taught. They were astounded at his teaching, for he taught them as one having authority, and not as the scribes. Just then there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit, convulsing him and crying with a loud voice, came out of him. They were all amazed, and they kept on asking one another, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. At once his fame began to spread throughout the surrounding region of Galilee. The Gospel of the Lord. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of each heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. We might be a little embarrassed when lessons like today's come up. Demons, really? Is not belief in demons an anachronistic, superstitious holdover from a darker time? Has not medicine explained where diseases come from? No one in the time of Jesus knew about epilepsy, germs, or mental illness. The results of these things they attributed to demonic activity is belief in demons anti-science. Should we not quietly move these exorcism texts out of the lectionary and write them off as the misunderstandings of a less enlightened people? And yet, Jesus believed in demons, lest he would not cast them out. And if Jesus was the Son of God, should he not know everything? And not only that, but today's text is in the canon of Scripture, as surely as is the birth narrative of Jesus and the resurrection story. How can we separate the parts of Scripture we accept in faith from the things we believe are the byproducts of superstition and ignorance? Would that not make our own opinions the authority over Scripture rather than those who accept the authority of Scripture? Or are demons real? And over the last 2,000 years, we have become so blind to their work that we suffer under their influence unknowingly. These questions are above the pay grade of a simple preacher such as myself. And indeed, if you ask five different Christians about demons, the authority of Scripture, and what Jesus does and doesn't know, you would probably get five different answers. And so in today's short message, I will restrict myself to what the Spirit does tell me through this simple story, which perhaps we are meant to accept simply. 
I used to love to visit a gentleman whom I will call John. He lived in a small care facility. He got around in a wheelchair and had one arm which he could not move because of a stroke suffered years before. He was decades younger than everyone else living with him in the facility because it was not age that had put him there. But rather, as I was told even before I first visited him, he had suffered from a terrible alcohol problem, which had ruined his health early in life. John told me lots of stories about his past each time I visited him, about his talents as a drummer. He told me stories about bands he had played with over the years, stories which I found out later did not quite be true, but perhaps the telling of them brought some lightness to his day, and so it was worth a fib or two. He tricked me into smuggling in ice cream, which I later learned he was medically not supposed to have, which we shared one day, and it was on that day he finally brought up some of the bad parts of his past. I had made up my mind I would never come out and ask him about his addiction, but would wait until he told me about it, and when he did, it seemed like a pretty important moment for both of us. I know what the devil looks like for me, he said. I know what evil looks like and tastes like. And in the air of that room, it was thick with regret and with sadness. But as we talked, there was a slow change. It had obviously been good for him to name out loud to another soul what his demons had looked like for him. To not have to pretend about what had happened. And even in a rather bleak situation for John, he had some laughs that day and some joy. I don't remember if we had communion on that visit or not, but even if we didn't, it seemed like Jesus showed up and smuggled strawberry ice cream. I wouldn't put it past him. Fate conspires sometimes to show us exactly what our own personal demons look like. For John and for many others, that demon is substance abuse. And COVID has made those things more difficult. The demons we see in Scripture all have something in common. They're trying to limit the lives of those they inhabit so that they cannot enjoy the lives that God intends them to have. And addiction does the same thing. The way to get through these days is not to shackle ourselves to things that hurt us. If you are struggling with addiction, freedom is possible and help is available. And today, not six months from now, not a year, not ten years, today is the day to find your freedom in the name of Jesus. Sometimes we also talk about the demons of our past. I've discovered something interesting about people over the years. For one, being in a strange time makes you more open to thinking about the big picture. Being in the hospital, for instance, even for something not very serious, causes a person to reflect and sometimes even open themselves to growth and change. And in addition, for whatever reason, folks will wait till you're about to leave their hospital room before they decide to tell you what's really on their minds. It's been nice visiting with you, I've said, and upon that they will tell me of stress, from their relationship with their fathers from decades past, broken relationships, old sins, old mistakes. Being in a time of transition or stress sort of helps people figure out what's important, whether good or bad. And if this working definition of the demonic holds true, then these things from the past can surely limit life like the demons in scriptures. How many of our current relationships are not what they could be because we have not forgiven someone who hurt us? How much friendship, intimacy, and camaraderie have we missed out on because we're held back by old things and bitter? That is so much why confession and forgiveness is at the heart of what we do as a church. That's why communally we intentionally think about those things that on a normal day we would rather not think about so as to bring them out together into the light of God's day 
that they might be seen and heard and healed. In the thoughts of ancient peoples, knowing the names of angels and demons gave a person power over them. That thought is in the backdrop of today's gospel when the demon knows the name of Jesus and yet cannot control him. And also in the story of the Gerasene demoniac when the demon tells Jesus that his name is Legion. In confession and forgiveness, we get the opportunity to name the things that limit our lives, our growth, our faith, our peace, our relationships. Name them so that we can have power over them in the name of Christ. So that each day we live as forgiven agents of forgiveness, free from the past, full of hope for the future, and filled with the Spirit in the here and now. Today's gospel might raise a lot of questions, but there is a simple message we can glean from it that I believe we are meant to hear. That this Jesus has power over demons. That this Jesus, risen from the dead, is with us always in faith. And that his power to bring healing and wholeness has never been diminished. Jesus said, I came that they might have life and have it abundantly. And by the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the courage and the hope to name whatever is holding us back from that abundant life and to meet it with the forgiveness and freedom of Christ. You are not alone in the struggle to live a righteous and joyous life. Christ is with you, silencing the voices that oppose God's voice so that you too, may stand amazed with the synagogue crowds at this Jesus. He commands even the unclean spirits, and indeed, they obey him. Thanks be to God. Now let us confess our sin, trusting in the abundant grace of God. Holy God, you search us and know us. You are acquainted with all our ways. We confess that our hearts are burdened by sin our own sins, and the broken systems that bind us. We turn inward, failing to follow your outward way of love. We distrust those who are not like us. We exploit the earth and its resources and fail to consider generations to come. Forgive us, gracious God, for all we have done and left undone. Even before the words are on our tongues, you know them. Receive them in your divine mercy. Amen. How vast is God's grace. Through the power and promise of Christ Jesus, our sins are washed away and we are claimed as God's own beloved. Indeed, we are forgiven. In the wake of God's forgiveness, we are called to be the beloved community, living out Christ's justice and the Spirit's reconciling peace. Amen. Guided by Christ, made known to the nations, let us offer our prayers for the church, the world, and all people in need. For Susan, our bishop, and all her staff, for the pastors and teachers and leaders of all the congregations of Kansas City and our nation, that all may proclaim the good news of God's reconciling love. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For our elected officials, for Joe, our president, for nonprofit and governmental organizations, for the planning commissions and homeless advocates, 
that God inspire equity in all times and places. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For those who are sick, especially those affected with COVID-19, for nurses, for doctors, relief workers, for those giving out vaccines and those who are waiting for them, for all in the midst of suffering, and especially those we now name aloud or in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. For the children of our community, as they learn either in person or at a distance, that you would give them wisdom and peace in difficult times. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And thanksgiving for our ancestors in the faith and those whose lives serve as an example for gospel living, that they point us to salvation through Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful God, hear the prayers of your people, spoken or silent, for the sake of the one who dwells among us, your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all.
Now let us pray using the words our Savior taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. God, the Creator, strengthen you. Jesus, the Beloved, fill you. And the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, keep you in peace now and forever.